So uh, thanks to the organizers, uh, Mamita Kimberly Norris for um, inviting me to talk with Christoph. This is um, an excellent opportunity. And so uh, as Christoph was just talking about um, mechanosensing, sensing kind of at the organism level, I'm gonna be zooming in to single cells and in fact, uh, even into single proteins, looking at the cytoskeleton and in particular the vimentin cytoskeleton and its mechanobiology features. And so this work is really uh, mostly done by my graduate students, Max Woger and Sartek Gupta uh, at Syracuse University. Max has done mainly the experiments and Sartak uh, has been running simulations and he's co-mentored with uh, Jennifer Schwartz at Syracuse. So uh, just to give a brief picture of mechanobiology, mechanosensing at the cell level, right? Cells are soft and uh, they have energy that they can exert to change their shape. And that's done mainly through the cytoskeleton, which gives, it, gives the cell its strength. And so the cell is anchored in tissues with an ECM and its point of contact are the focal adhesions, um, which are made of in part an integrin uh, in the ECM and a receptor. And, um, from that point of contact, the cell can start building up forces. And so it can connect to the cytoskeleton and to the motors in the cytoskeleton, here shown actin. And eventually those forces can be uh, either coupled to biochemical signals that change the cell behavior uh, or even mechanical effects that change how the cell spreads or moves. And so um, there's really this playback between the biology and the functions of the cells and the mechanical properties of the cell environment, but also the mechanical properties of the cell itself, which the cell can adapt depending um, on the biology of what it wants to do. So there's this coupling and feedback. And uh, a large aim of my research group is to understand what Vimentin uh, is doing in this mechanical model of the cell. And so I, I quickly drew Vimentin over this nucleus this morning. Uh, not my greatest work, but what is Vimentin? Uh, so, right, the, it's part of the cytoskeletal network and in mammalian cells, uh, there's three main cytoskeletal polymers. There's microtubules, actin, and um, I have shown Vimentin, which is a type of intermediate filaments. So intermediate filaments, um, unlike actin and microtubules, aren't expressed in every eukaryotic cell. Um, Intermediate filaments are expressed in metazoan cells, and so they kind of correspond with the origin of multicellular organisms and perhaps the stresses that are unique to being a multicellular organism. And I can show you, and so they have interesting mechanical properties too. And I, I want to show you this example of hagfish slime. So hagfish slime is really rich in intermediate filaments. And so this is from the the Vancouver Aquarium, but you get a sense of how stretchy and squishy and viscoelastic this material is. And so it can actually uh, undergo very long elongational strains and not actually rupture. And so uh, if we take, take these materials or we reconstitute the cytoskeletal networks from the cells, we can do the mechanics and rheology tests. And so we've known for quite a while at least since the 90s, that intermediate filaments uh, mechanically could sustain much long stresses and strains, unlike actin and microtubules, which they have that uh, longer persistence length. So they're a bit more fib fibrillar in nature and more rigid and perhaps more susceptible to breakage and large, large strains. So it suggests kind of a unique mechanical role for these you know, squishy intermediate filaments. And so Vimentin in particular is expressed um, in mesenchymal cells, so uh, in fibrous, uh, fibrous tissues, connective tissues, and um, they're often expressed in migratory cells. So uh, there's a transition in biology called the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, where epithelial cells, which are in close contact with each other, uh, transition to these mesenchymal cells that migrate out into the ECM uh, network. And so this occurs during development, but also thought to occur during cancer. And there is a connection between vimentin expression and um, cancer metastasis. So 
high bimentin levels often correlate with poor prognosis um, for many different types of cancers. But the under but uh, the mechanism hasn't been understood. Okay, so um, this is work actually I started in my or is motivated by work I did during my postdoc with Paul Jamney, and we are investigating this um, bimentin knockout cell model. So these are mouse embryo fibroblasts. Um, these are from these these came to us from Bob Goldman's group, and they're from mice that bimentin has been knocked out of, and these mice do develop. Uh, and so you can isolate the cells and there's, um, they produce actin fibers, just like a wild type cell. They produce, um, lots of focal adhesions, just like null cells, but they're missing intermediate filaments. So here in the, in the bottom, just some nonspecific staining that you might see, uh, in the null cell and using, um, using these cell lines, one of the things um, we were prompted to do was to look at how these null cells move um, in 3D environments. And so in this case, I'm showing you cells moving um, through an ECM network, which has pore sizes about two, um, about one to two uh, microns in diameter. We also looked in microchannels, PDMS microchannels, you can see similar things. And what we found was that in, um, Cell, in cells without bimentin, the nucleus experience much longer elongations um, and was then therefore susceptible to these large stresses as cells try to like squeeze through these small port, small pores, and this le leads to damage of the nucleus. And so here what I'm showing is you see the, the nucleus is fluorescent. The fluorescent tag is on the nuclear nuclear locator sequence, and so uh, there's a moment where the nucleus breaks open, and the signal, this nuclear material, gets released into the right the rest of the cell. And so that's right about you can see it's very contorted, and right about yeah here it gets released, and then actually the cell has mechanisms that it goes takes that nuclear material and sticks it back in but it can lead to more DNA damage and cause, uh, can cause more cell death. Um, so here, here's some quantification where our null cells or minus minus cells have more rupture, uh, but this was um, particularly important for a 3D gel compared to cells just on the 2D glass where the cells aren't subject to quite as high stresses uh, and they don't rupture as often. And I want to make a note that um, there's no evidence thus far, really, that the nucleus itself is more is softer or more deformable in these null cells. So um, we are with with Goldman's group. We've measured that the lamin levels A, B, and C are approximately the same. And um, also in, in Paul's group, they've done they've isolated these nuclei out, out of the cell and done AFM testing. And outside the cell, the nucleus has the same stiffness. So it's really something about bimentin in the cell and perhaps cushioning the nucleus and preventing those large deformations that might cause damage. Okay, and um, I just wanted to mention that um, Sarthik's been um, working on simulations and creating a dynamic model for these cells moving. And so he can capture the effects of imentin on cell speed. And he has this really nice polarity mechanism. And so this was uh, just accepted to New Journal of Physics. And um, it's a topic for another talk, but I thought I thought I would mention it here. OK. All right, so you know, ultimately, we want to understand this finding that imentin is impacting how cells move in a confined environment, something that looks like a real tissue. And um, we also want to understand how it's protecting the nucleus from damage, right? And obviously in these biological systems, there's a lot of parameters involved. And so we can kind of start <laughs> breaking it down. And I hear I just have some factors that are at play, right? Could be the mechanics and assembly of the cytoskeletal networks themselves, this momentum nucleus interaction, how is it connected to the nucleus? Uh, interactions with the other cytoskeletal elements, how it's involved in sensing the stiffness 
of the of its environment, which regulates how fast it moves, among other things, and also are there does it uh, connect with the focal adhesions? And of course, there's many other groups working on Vimentin and trying to answer these questions. Um, I'm going to show you some recent work, particularly about this ECM stiffness sensing. And so to do this, we're going to go back to a 2D system where we can very uh, have much more control over the mechanical properties of the substrate that we subject the cells to. And so this is kind of a basic primer of if you come into a mechanical sensing lab, what you might find for cells uh, if you do this type of experiment. So the idea is real tissues, right, can vary from very soft, like the brain, to muscle, which is stiffer, to, to bone, which is much stiffer. And so you can make these um, synthetic polyacrylamide gels, okay, which tactilely you can think of um, a soft contact lens. Okay, the first soft contact lenses are made out of this polyacrylamide. So you make these contact lenses in the lab. And um, if, you, if you feed cells, many different cells, here we're looking at fibroblasts, which are you know, the main producers of ECM and tissues. And so if you have a wound, that they, they come in and help repair that. But they, uh, they, what you'll see, although there are exceptions, those cells will, uh, will spread out further on a stiffer substrate. And so here's some quantification of that with glass really being the most stiff substrate that we'll use in the lab. And so here I'm just showing cell area, but uh, many different functions of the cells will change based on uh, the stiffness of the substrate. So motility, proliferation rates, uh, and even, even cellular differentiation. So a cell can, um, that will change from one, type, one cell type into another uh, might no longer do that if you put it on a soft or stiff substrate. Okay, so um, my graduate student, Max, took some lovely pictures of, of fibroblasts spread out on these soft gels on the left all the way to the stiff gels. And, um, one of the features that we see with Vimentin is that it's very um, kind of, it's always kind of close to the nucleus. And as the cell spreads out on super substrates, that network kind of gets pulled on, it's under more tension. Um, and on the very stiff substrates, these Vimentin networks are really going all the way out to the cell periphery. And, you know, perhaps you can see from the images, uh, intermediate filaments are a very abundant protein in the cell. So what was interesting, or, or it's been a little bit of a puzzle, is that if you put these cells on a physiologically relevant uh, sub substrate stiffness, say 5 kPa, there's not a huge phenotype difference between the two. So on the right is the wild type and on the left is the vitamin to non. They're a little bit smaller here. And you can actually do this full, for the full range of stiffnesses. And what you see is, um, all in all, <laughs> They're, they're roughly the same area. But if you look closely, you will see um, some differences and it depends on the stiffness. So on, um, on a soft substrate, we find that the wild type cells get more spread out. And on a stiff substrate, it's the null cells that are more spread out. So it's not like you knock out Vimentin and all of a sudden all the cells are just smaller. No, it, it has this, it's uh, dependent on the substrate you put the cells on. So it, it suggests there's some um, its effects on cell spreading or substrate stiffness dependent. And so this made us think about what other uh, processes I meant to my control. And uh, one, of the, one of the common features that you'll look at in um, mechano sensing is what are the forces that the cell is generating on the substrate. And so you can do this with traction force experiments. So if you have a soft gel and you embed that gel with tracer particles, the cell will pull on that substrate and, and move the particles around. And knowing the stiffness of the substrate and knowing how far the beads get displaced, you can estimate what that force is. And so here, here's um, some typical pictures of what that, that will look like for a cell. And indeed, if you do this for a soft substrate or a stiff substrate, you'll find that on the soft substrates, wild type cells generate more uh, force. And perhaps counterintuitively, on these stiffer substrates, we find that null cells 
are able to generate just as much force, actually more force than cells that have thymentin. Okay, so actually there's been an, uh, a few people who, who've seen this. So Kapana uh, in collaboration, she did these experiments and I'm showing you, but also Min Tan when he, um, and his group with Chi Wen, uh, they also uh, just published something very similar showing that Vimentin's effect on uh, force generation, mechanosensing is substrate stiffness dependent. Okay, so the, one of the next places we looked at were the focal adhesions. So remember, these are the points where the cell makes contact with the ECM, and these are the points through which cells can should transmit those forces to the substrate. And so uh, Vimentin indeed does interact with um, focal adhesions. And so here are some uh, images from this 2014 paper and with, with plectin, they're showing you a connection between momentum and some of the focal adhesion proteins, vinculin in this case. And so what, we've, uh, what we find and which other groups have found um, is that these null cells on a SIF substrate have more focal adhesions and larger focal adhesions. Okay, so this is consistent with on a SIF substrate, the null cells have generating more force because the number of focal adhesions roughly corresponds with how much force the cell can generate. And so um, actually this was first that I know of observed in 98, and it wasn't really understood why, but um, in some very recent work from the McCulloch group here, they've um, actually show a connection between vimentin and integrin expression. So thymentin is involved in regulating the trafficking of, of the beta-1 integrin. So beta-1 is the main receptor for collagen. And so these null cells have more integrins and it turns out they have um, kind of slower turnover of the focal adhesions than they should. And that's what it looks like on a stiff substrate. And if you look at this on a soft substrate, First of all, we don't get these like, you know, beautiful adhesions you see on a stiff substrate on a soft gel. There, the pexillin is much more cytoplasmic, but we do see, you know, little, little points of adhesions for these cells on soft substrates. And if you compare on the glass, sub, um, on the stiff substrate versus a soft substrate, now, again, there's been a reversal where there's more adhesions for a wild type cell than a null cell. So again, this is consistent with at least more adhesions or more, more adhesions, more forces for wild type cells on a cis substrate versus a soft substrate. All right. So how do we understand this substrate stiffness behavior uh, of momentum? So one way to do it is this um, biomechanical picture. And so uh, this is work done in collaboration with Farid from Vivek Chinois group at Penn. And the classic picture, right, of course it doesn't have momentum, but it has actin in microtubules and these cell substrate adhesions. And so in this picture, the cell forms adhesions with the substrates with this like spring-like interaction and actin are under, actin builds up under tension, sort of pushes down on the nucleus and the microtubules end up being under compression from those actin forces. And so Farid's insight was, well, let's put vimentin in parallel with both the actin component and both the microtubule component. You know, and this made a lot of, makes a lot of sense because we know that intermediate filaments uh, do form networks with actin and microtubules. There are crosslinkers in the cell that connect uh, vimentin to both actin and to microtubules. And in fact, um, if, we, if we look at some of our pictures, what in the null cells, we see that microtubule organization is sort of altered in some weird way. And in particular, we see these long uh, strands of microtubule filaments that we don't see in the wild type cells. And so it suggests that these microtubules might, know, uh, might not be under as much compression as they would be compared to the wild type cells. Okay, so if we take this you know, uh, model and you put the cell on a substrate that's soft or stiff, so our x-axis here is matrix stiffness and on the y-axis it's the stress that the cell can generate 
when it has these um, two components. Again, there is a, a myosin component in here, but I just kind of highlighted that bimentin is in parallel with the microtubule part and an actin part. These two components um, dominate a different amounts of ECM stiffness. And so the idea, and indeed with these blue and red lines, you see that the wild type cells are able to build up a lot of stress on a soft matrix, but on a stiff matrix, these I mentioned all cells are, are able to overcome them. And so at a conceptual level, what's happening is uh, for low actin tension, bimentin is really reinforcing the microtubules component which allows cells to increase. But at the high tension component, actin is gonna dominate no matter what. And actin and bimentin only serves to reinforce actin more. And these actin forces are strong enough to uh, buckle these microtubules, which cause the cells um, not to be spread as much. And so this, it captures you know, qualitative, quantitatively the change in, um, traction stress that we observe for neural cells and soft and stiff substrates, uh, explains the cell spreading, and in part, you know, explains the differences in the microtubule organization that we see. Okay, so um, throughout my talk, or just one extra nugget, tissues are not only elastic, but they're viscoelastic, okay? So um, uh, some of us, I know at least me, you know, have some flubber, and we know that the viscoelastic material, so, I know Christoph had in his picture, the, uh, I think a viscoelastic tissue. We have the spring component that's elastic. And from a mechanical viewpoint, there's a, a dash pot which interacts with viscous stamping um, that, that gives you this viscoelasticity of real tissues. And um, it's important because the viscoelastic nature of these tissues uh, changes if, if, the, if the tissue becomes diseased. So, um, Here's some compression tests from um, uh, Leventhal and, and, and Paul Jamney's group where they show this, this, relax, this relaxation occurs in a diseased tissue, but not so much in a healthy tissue. And so um, we've been designing viscoelastic polyacrylamide gels in the group. Um, this is really work that started with Elizabeth Charrier and she came up with this design protocol. And the trick is you take your literally elastic cross-linked network and you um, take long chains of polyacrylamide and you mix the two together. So you cross-link this network around these long viscous chains and these long chains, when, you, when they get stretched out, they take time, right, to recoil and that gives some relaxation to the gel. It makes a viscoelastic gel. And so uh, we have gel elastic gels, with a G prime of 5 kPa, a very negligible viscous noise. And our viscoelastic gel has a similar stiffness, 5 kPa, and one tenth um, uh, the, the, the loss modulus. And so that's about what it is for tissues uh, where you have about one tenth G double prime to G prime. And so I showed you this picture before on the left where there's not a huge difference in cell spreading between wild type and bimentin all cells. But if you had just a little bit of viscoelasticity, um, you know, that, that 10%, you'll see the, the, the wild type cells have a decrease in, uh, in area, but it's much more significant for our bimentin null cells. So um, bimentin null cells are not spreading well on substrates with viscoelasticity. Uh, and it's, it's an even bigger effect than just the effects of substrate stiffness. This is much bigger than the effects we see typically for just changes in substrate stiffness. And it's not that these cells can't spread out. So the null cells do spread out initially, but they're not sustaining that uh, spreading out. And I will quickly wrap up. Just briefly, we've, we've quantified um, the presence of actin fibers and focal adhesions for both cell types on elastic and viscoelastic gels, there's not, um, there's not a very evident difference in actin or viscoelasticity, but I would like to pr propose perhaps two possible uh, mechanisms that would explain this. So one idea is that momentum might be involved in regulating um, the dynamics of the focal adhesions. And in fact, this has been reported previously for a stiff substrate, but we don't know for a soft or a viscoelastic substrate. But the idea, right, so 
and in my, just conceptually from my picture here, right? It's like the cell on a viscoelastic substrate, it's maybe like you're trying to walk on cornstarch or something, right? Where it's not that you're running that's making you move, right? If you move on um, water, you're not gonna move at all. It's the fact that you're able to move faster than the cornstarch will dissipate those stresses. So it's a coupling between your on and off rate and the dissipation of the substrate. And so if, if I mentioned tuning the adhesion time with the substrate time, that could lead to an increase in, in cell spreading in a way that you wouldn't get in just an elastic substrate. And perhaps another idea is just, is the way that Vimentin helps organize and integrate over actomyosin forces. And so it's known that these traction forces aren't quite as organized for the Vimentin uh, cell. And so uh, on a viscoelastic substrate, you'd think it'd be very, it might be more important to have those um, actomyosin forces integrated um, in a more organized and sustained way uh, that's even more important when you have this viscous dissipation that's trying to take away that force you're building up. Okay, so those are my conclusions. I see I'm running over. Um, maybe I'll just say, I saw Sarah Koster was on here at least earlier and at the IF meeting last week, she taught me that intermediate filaments are a high performance biomaterial and a safety belt. So I'll pass that along and they, they tune the cell's response to mechanical stresses. And um, yeah, thanks to my group and thanks to the organizers again for inviting me. Thank you, Ellie, for a wonderful talk. So we have some questions, so I will get right to the questions. So the first is from Rafael Petroshan, and he's asking, he's saying, thanks for an interesting talk. What is the primary reason that makes Vimentin to stay intact at high stresses slash strains where microtubules and uh, effectin break? Is it uh, specific struct structural architecture or properties of the proteins making the filament or, or something else? Yeah, yeah. So um, I didn't have time to talk about this, but their structural properties are very different. And um, intermediate filaments really have um, these large building blocks that are more complicated than just actin and microtubules. And they also, and these individual building blocks can, can stretch out. And so they get this coil coil structure that will stretch out in a nonlinear way. And on top of that, you often get um, individual filaments that kind of are bound together and they will slide with respect to each other. All right, uh, and then Sriram Ramaswamy is asking, uh, hi, Allison, if the system is stationary, G double prime should go through zero if you can really reach zero frequency. Is that frequency just too low or is the system not stationary or something else? If G, prime, if G double prime goes all the way to zero. Um, these are viscoelastic solids in the sense that they're going to return back to their initial configuration. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. No, no, um, G double prime is odd in omega and should, should go through zero. And if it doesn't, it just means either there's a very long time, long time scale in the problem that you, you, know, you haven't gone past that uh, inverse of that longest time scale or the material itself is not stationary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in terms of frequency, it should go to zero, that axis you're thinking. Of the yeah, G, G, G double prime by, by definition should go through zero. Ah, zero. Okay. Because it's um, I think we're from our rheometer, we're very far from that regime. Right. Um, I mean, we're also, you know, trying to think about what are the time scales relevant to the cells. So that's a really important question. We don't know what are, exactly what are the time scales of the cells um, probing the substrate. So um, maybe we could talk more about what you're suggesting, but from a practical point, I don't think we're there. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so then Christoph is asking, uh, Christoph is saying great talk. And then he's asking when the nucleus bursts in the Vimentin, uh, zero cells, is it blebbing? Is there still membrane around the DNA? Um, so you can take pictures of the nuclear lamina um, or, or live even. And so you, when there's a bleb, usually you'll see this pocket of lamin A where the bleb is. Um, 
And then sometimes that lemon A can even rupture transiently. So um, I don't know if that answers your questions. There, there, it's it's a dynamic process, but it does try and reform. I mean, this was not, of course, your main point, but I was really uh, curious about the mechanism the DNA gets back in. And so, if it's like cells blabbing, then of course the membrane can pull it back in. But if it's floating around freely, then that, that must be an interesting story. Well, so the NLS that it, you saw would be um, soluble factors, right? Also, the DNA is not getting out, you're saying. So again, we could take a picture of a blev, and usually there are there is chromatin in the blev, although I don't actually know how much of that chromatin is getting, the chromatin itself is getting released. I see. You just you have a pressure thing that it releases small stuff, but not necessarily the chromatin. Or or it, it could be connected to you know the creation of micronuclei. I see. Thanks. Thank you, Christoph. Thanks both Christoph and, and Ali. So we will stop the recording and move on to the, uh, you know, the informal part of the discussion.